Friends, I wanna, we're gonna start off today talking about the love of God. I've been thinking a lot about the love of God this last week, and I've also been thinking about how the word of God is translated. That's something I always think about when I think about biblical texts. I'm always interested in how things are actually translated. And you know, there's the strange things that you notice about the English language when you begin to study other languages. I don't know any other languages, but I study a lot of other languages. And uh, this last week I was in Northern Canada and they speak English, but you have to study to understand them, right? And I'm sure I sound like I'm from Mars when I talk to them. And it's just because of our accents and the way that we swing our words and the way that we, the way that we interact with each other. And it's beautiful. I love people in Northern Canada. I, they are some of the sweetest people on the planet Earth. They're such nice people. Well, I got to look in and, and I was thinking about the love of God. And it's like, well, man, when I get back to Leanna, there's a couple of things I want to do. I want to eat a chicken fried steak because I love me some chicken fried steak. And I wanna love on Leanna, cause I really love me some Leanna. And you know what, man? I love just walking around my property and I wanna go see all the things that's going on in my property. I wanna go check all my feeders. I wanna see all my animals. Okay, well, I'm using one word, love, for different expressions of love. Because in the English language, we have one word, love. But it's not so in Hebrew, and it's certainly not so in Greek. Greek is so much more descriptive than the English language, and you can actually be very you can actually be very precise. Now, in the Bible, the word love is translated from four different words. Now, we just say love, but there are actually four different words that describe four different expressions of love that we just translate into the plain old English language as love. The first one is eros. Eros is a word that we get the word erotic from, and it has to do with sexual love. It has to do with, you know, it's described. We might guess what that word means. Again, it has to do with sexual attraction, and it has to do with sexuality. So that kind of love is legit, it's real, but it's a small part of the broad spectrum of love, but we just call it love. The second word that we translate into love is storge. And storge is a Greek word that actually defines family love. Obviously, that should have nothing to do with eros. You do not sexualize children. You do know that, amen? Because the world doesn't know that anymore. And they need a big reminder from the body of King Jesus. Hallelujah. And so it's like, okay, so that means family love. It's like, okay, there's a way that you love your dad. There's a way that you love your mama. There's a way that you love your kids. There's a way that you love, and it, so that's storge. And that's, that's really inclusive, or inclusive, I should say, exclusive to your family dynamics, right? But then there's another word that we translate as love, and it's called philia. And philia is where we get the word, you know, Philadelphia. And it means brotherly love. And it has to do with the kind of covenant between grown men and grown women that we say this. Are you ready? I will never form a mob against you. We need more of that within the body of King Jesus. I will never join a mob against you. If I have a difference with you, I will discuss it with you privately or I will dismiss it and not discuss it at all. But I will never, ever, ever join a mob or form a mob against you. That is so important. But then guys, we come to the word agape and agape is a kind of love, man, that we're gonna be talking about today. Agape is a Greek word that describes the selfless love of God. It is not temporary love, it's forever love. It is not situational love, it is eternal love. It's always selfless, it's always self-giving, it gives without demanding, it is the God kind of love, it gives without expecting repayment. And are you ready for this? Agape love is not natural to human beings. Agape love has nothing to do with your survival. Agape love has to do with you have been in the presence of the Lord. Jesus, amen. Jesus said, this is how they'll know that you're my disciple, that you love each other. It's like there's something that happens when you start hanging out with King Jesus. You start to love God and you start to love people because the love of God has that high of an impact upon your own life. This is why we need the presence of the Lord. This is why we need this experience. This is why we have to know godly people. This is why we have to know how to, how to privately find God and how to publicly find God. Amen? 
So agape is extraordinary. It comes from God. It doesn't come from anything on this planet. There's no animal that has ever been able to operate in agape love. Like, oh no, my animals love me so much. Your animals love you because you feed them. <laughs> like, no, no, it's different for me. No, no, it's not. I got tons of animals and I love my animals and my animals love me, most of them do. My stupid donkeys don't always love me. I don't know why, because I want to be their friend so bad. Did Leanna preach on that last week? Oh, I just got that, because I could tell y'all know about that. We didn't have internet where I was at, so I wasn't able to see it. But I go out there to befriend them, and they'll say, hello, I'm your friend, and then they'll eat, and then they kick me and run off. And I go into my ultra wrath mode, right? I'm like, I will be friends with you. And like, no, you won't. We like Leanna. We like the grandkids. They're super nice, my grandkids. But they just don't like me. I don't know why. Like something's wrong with them. They're defective donkeys. But there's never been an animal that has actually operated in agape love. And now I'm going to tell you this. There's, there's, there's few human beings that actually operate in it. The only people that can operate in agape love are people who have the spirit of the living God within them. Agape love is selfless, and sometimes agape love will cost you absolutely everything. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul begins to describe this agape love. Not, not eros, not the other two, but this is agape love. So if you guys have your Bibles, please open up 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And again, this is called the love chapter. Everybody just say the love chapter. You got to say it cool, the love chapter. Mm-hmm. Okay, Paul is talking about agape here, the mystery of agape, the, the beautiful layers of agape, how that we need to lean into agape and how that it's not natural. And this is why he says, well, let's talk about it. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I do not have agape, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I want to hold it on that verse right there and just talk to you about this. He says, if I'm really good with people, if I'm really good in natural realms, and if I'm really good in spiritual realms, but if I do not have agape, let me tell you what I'm like. I'm like a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Like, what is that? Was there anybody alive in the 1970s? Yeah, a few of us, a few of us old folks in here. Anybody remember the gong show? Oh, so good at the church stuff. So eloquent in speech. Oh, he knows so much scripture. He knows so much scripture. Oh, he knows how to do church. Oh, look at how he can address people. And then Mean Gene, the dancing machine, come out. It's like gong, gong, gong. It matters nothing. It's just entertainment. Amen. If you do not have agape, like why is that? Because your eloquent speech will fail and it doesn't last. You can drink too much coffee and go, blah, 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 and you're done. What about if you speak with the tongues of angels? What about, if you're, what about if you're such a supernatural person, you're so full of the Holy Spirit, and you're actually uttering mysteries? The day will come that there will be, none of that matters because you're just trying to breathe. I, oh, that's not true. It is absolutely true because you, like King David, go the way of all men unless the rapture happens. Boy, y'all got quiet on that. Amen. Listen, I believe in the rapture of the church. I'm going to hold out. People get mad at me. You're so foolish for believing in the rapture. Well, if you want to go through the tribulation, you have at it. We need good, godly Christian people in the tribulation. But you can color me gone. Amen. And if I'm wrong, I'll be doing the same thing in the tribulation that these people who hate me are probably not doing that I'm doing right now. I'll be reaching the world for King Jesus. I'm not waiting until the tribulation to get up and to actually do something. Come on. So, verse 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can literally remove mountains, but if I don't have agape... I am nothing. Well, that is something. Like, dude, if I, if I walk in faith, but I don't have agape, I still don't have anything? No. 
Like, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Wait, how can that be? Because faith is everything. Faith is the entryway to everything. And let me tell you what the love, let me tell you what agape is. And let me tell you the difference between faith. Faith is the, okay, I want to believe and I'm willing to believe. Amen. Like, yes, I have a yes in my spirit for belief. But I want to just tell you, if that's circumstantial faith, even if you can do something amazing, what if, what if you just go, okay, I can speak to a mountain and it can be moved. Can I tell you what's going to happen? It's going to move again sometime. It's not, it's a temporary situation. Um, in Canada last week, we were out fishing on a lake and one of the things you got to look for are these giant boulders because the lake was a little bit down and there are these incredible boulders like, well, why didn't they just mark them last year? They did, but it froze over and the ice moves those, bo- those boulders. They move. So even if you move a mountain, it's still going to move. Amen. So it's like, what, what's he saying? He's saying, no matter what exploits you do, no matter what incredible gifts you have, if you don't tap into the agape of God, you're not tapping into what is eternal. And we have to tap into what's going to last forever. All right. Verse three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, that's pretty daggum big sacrifice. But if I don't have agape, it doesn't profit me anything. So there is a way that you can serve God in a circumstance, and there's a way that you can serve God eternally in a circumstance. Are you guys tracking with me? All right, we're going to continue to look through this mystery of agape. And it says, and then verse 4 says, Now love, it suffers long and is kind. Okay, love suffers, am I on verse 4? Yep. Love suffers long and is kind, is patient and is kind. Those two are hooked together. We'll come back and revisit that. Agape does not envy. Agape does not parade itself. Agape is not puffed up. Agape does not behave rudely. Agape does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It doesn't think about evil things. I I, want to just stop before I continue on this because we're going to go through the 16 attributes of the love of God. 16 attributes of agape. And I want to just ask you this, you know, do you have a problem with patience? Agape will take that patience, will take that lack of patience right out of your life. Do you have a problem with being kind? Agape is the cure for that. Uh, Do you have a problem with looking over on the other side of the fence and going, gee, that house is nicer than my house. I wish I had that house. And and being too lazy to fix up your own house? Agape is the cure for that. That just made somebody mad. I felt it. (laughs) Well, if I could, I would. Then what makes you think you can afford their payment? Oh, I know it, sister. (laughs) Don't want what anybody else wants unless you're willing to pay the price that they pay for it. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Love does not parade itself. I'm just going to say something. You got something in you that wants to be a part of a drag show? Agape is a cure for that. Here's another one. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. One of the things is sitting in the wilderness out in the middle of nowhere last week, I would just be sitting there and all of a sudden an evil thought would hit me. And it had nothing to do with the situation I was in. Or some form of anxiety would hit me where I was thinking about a situation 2,000 miles south of where I was at. And I'm like, stop. Okay, you don't just try and wrestle the thought. The thought. You have to move into the love of God and displace it. Agape displaces evil thoughts. One of the reasons why the thoughts of men are evil continuously in these last days is because they have no respect or no love for God Almighty. And people who do not love God will end up thinking evil continuously. Verse 6 It does not rejoice in iniquity. It doesn't look over at the downfall of somebody and go, ha, 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 ha. It doesn't do that. But it rejoices in truth. 
It makes you go, man, that's what I'm talking about. When you hear truth, you rejoice. What does that mean? It means, it means you replay your intentionality to have joy over truth. Hmm. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You got something you say, man, I cannot bear this. You can with agape. You have something where you're like, I just can't believe that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that weird stuff. You can with agape. You could, it hopes all things. Like, I, I can't have hope today. When I just see the mess that's happening to our world and how it's all unraveling, I just don't know how to hope. The love of God can fix that for you. And it can endure all things. It, endure means this, you're gonna outlast the enemy. Amen. Don't you wanna outlast the enemy? I plan on outliving all of my critics in Jesus' name. So it's like, don't you want to outlast the enemy? Don't you want to be standing there whenever the enemy just gets exasperated and go, okay, I'm moving on to something else. Yeah, you move on. You go right ahead. The love of God gives you a supernatural ability to be able to do this. Don't you want to have more and more and more agape within your life? Amen? And then it says this, love never fails. Love never fails is, the, is an amazing attribute. It's the 16th attribute here. And I want to tell you, if you put the love of God up against anything, the love of God will win every single time. You name it. Well, I, okay, look, man, I, I made terrible mistakes my whole life. This kind of mess happened. I did all these horrible things. And then the love of God steps in the room with you. It wins every single time. Well, you don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to overcome. The love of God steps in. It wins every single time. Agape never fails. Agape never, ever, ever fails. Ever. Well, agape love, and it says, now, now by its faith, hope, and love, these three. Oh, wait, I'm missing some here. I, I, I'm sorry, guys, but I got to read this. Love never fails, verse 8. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Like, okay, then we shouldn't prophesy. No, it's just things are going to change. If I give you a prophecy right now and if I say to you, okay, look, here's the deal. The Spirit of the Lord is telling me that uh, this, this, this. That prophetic word is going to change later because you're going to move on. And so this is part of the developmental process of walking with God. And this is exactly what he's addressing here is there are things that are in development, but when you get to the end of it, it's all about agape. Okay, that that's where we're headed to. So whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. So it's like, okay, all right, well, let me just, just like, okay, so we shouldn't speak in tongues. We shouldn't, spray, we shouldn't pray in the spirit. We shouldn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. No, but I want to tell you, that's a part of the developmental process. And there's going to be a day that the end of that is agape. Amen. Here's another one. Uh, whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Well, nobody says that we shouldn't have knowledge. We should certainly know things. But again, it's developmental until we come into the fullness of agape. Right? And then it says, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, when that which is fully complete, when that which is all the way finally happens, then that which is in part will be done away with. So it's like, okay, look, there's a lot of things that are developmental. There's a lot of things that are in process that this is what our life is all about. But there's going to be a day that's going to come. We're not going to be developing anymore. We're not going to be in process anymore. We're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to stand in that beautiful, perfect place that Jesus wants us to. We don't have to develop. And you know what it's called? It's called agape. It's called the love of God. It says, for when I was a child, when I was in the development process, I spoke as somebody that was within the development process. And then it says, and I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So if you're 25 and still need to be potty trained, that's an issue. So it's like, okay, well, that's, that's really not the issue, unless I laugh too hard. <laughs> Or, you know, there's some, there's some circumstances, anything can happen. But with all that said, what's real is there's a way that you have to develop as a child and then you put away those development issues. 
When I was a child, I thought I was a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that literally means I quit messing with the process of that and I finally learned my lesson. Okay, how do you finally learn your lesson? Agape. How do you finally complete the process? Agape. Are you sick and tired of the same thing coming to you over and over and over and over and over again? Here's, here's, here's the cure for that. Agape. Oh, that's a good word. It says, for now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Like now we are developing into who Jesus sees us as. You, know, you have not yet seen the you that Jesus sees, but you will. And it says this, now I know in part, but then I shall, but then I shall know just as I am also known. So I am now in a time of joyous discovery of my own identity. I'm in a time of joyous discovery of who I am and what I'm capable of. And you know, this last week I learned so many things about myself just in being alone and isolated for, you know, for five days. And you know, you're out there for you know, six hours, 10 hours at a time in the middle of nowhere where they drop you off and say, we'll come back at 10.30 at night. And you're there and you discover things about yourself. Now I already knew I was scared of heights. And that stand was way up and I already knew that. But I was like, no, I can overcome this and I can sit here and I can endure this. But, but there are some things that, that, that alarmed me that I didn't know would alarm me. And then there was other things that I just handled in a really cool way that I went, I didn't know I could do that. Well, I'm in a process of discovery of my own identity. And guys, I'm gonna be 57 years old this year. And I'm like, okay, man, I'm, I'm, I'm but listen, there's gonna be a day I, when I see Jesus face to face, he is that mirror. And I'm going to see him the way that he sees me. And you know what? That means looking into his eye and I see, I see me through the reflection of his eye. That's called the apple of his eye. When my image is as he sees me and I see me, you know why? Because I see him. Oh, see, there's no more development after that. We're in this huge development, line upon line, precept upon precept, faith to faith, Glory to glory, everlasting unto everlasting, deep unto deep, step to step, here a little, there a little. And we're moving slowly. But he's talking about, let me tell you, there's gonna be a day, my friends, that all that's gonna end. And let me tell you what's gonna remain, agape love. Oh, listen, church, we need to know, we need to understand agape. We need to understand the love of God. It needs to be something we talk about, something we sing about. It needs to be something that we meditate about. Because I wanna tell you, man, these processes wear us out, don't they? They do. Man, I don't like the developmental process more than anybody else. I just want to get there. Let's go. But like, no, if you get there and let's go, your lungs will not have developed and you will die in that environment. If you get there real quick, uh, your muscles will not have development and it, when you will fall off the side of that cliff. So he's like, no, we have to do this. We have to make this right. And then in verse 12, he says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know just as I am also known. And now he says this, <laughs> now, right now, what abides is faith, hope, and love. Everybody say faith, hope, and love. Say that. Faith, man, is hearing God speak, but you don't see anything. Faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things unseen. So faith is, okay, I heard God speak and because I trust in the character of the Lord, I'm believing, but I do not see it. Hope is, yeah, you know what? I can actually see it happening. Now I'm hoping it will happen. But love is when you stand in that solid place of agape, where you are, where it's gone all the way. It's happened the way that it's supposed to have and the kingdom has come. And then the last part of that says, but the greatest of these is love. Why? Because agape, the love of God, will outlast your faith and your hope. You're not gonna have hope after you see Jesus because you don't need it. Amen. You're not gonna have faith after you see Jesus because you don't need it. You're walking in the fullness of what God Almighty has for you and that is the love of God. That is agape. So how am I doing, guys? All right. Well, there are 16 attributes, and I get really excited about all these numbers. There, there are 16 attributes of the love of God here. And 16, everybody say sweet 16, just say that. It means the love of God, 
There are 16 baptisms in the Bible. The word baptism, 16 times. And by the way, guys, we're having baptism services this coming Wednesday night. How do you profess the love of God? You know, how do you publicly demonstrate an illustrated sermon? How do you do that? Of you've given your life to Christ. You're dead to the world and you're resurrected in him. How do you do that? Through the power of baptism. There's 16 baptism. Um, let's see here. There are 16 commands that God Almighty gives to the nation of Israel. 1 Corinthians 13 has 16 attributes. Acts chapter 15, verse 25, the 16th time that Paul's name is mentioned, he's called beloved. It's one of the prophetic ways that you count scriptures is you count the first name of Abraham and then you count how many times is his name in the Bible? What's the seventh time? What's the 10th time? What's the 12th time? What's the 16th time? And look at the scripture accordingly. And the 16th time that Paul, that his name is written, it, he's called beloved. And let me tell you what the name for beloved is in Hebrew, okay? It's David. So he's like, Paul tapped into that, into that David kind of anointing. He tapped into it. Oh, that's a good word. And the, that, where did that come from? It comes from agape. I promise you, David had a revelation of agape love way before the rest of the world knew it. Amen. When the world wasn't even speaking Greek, when the word agape wasn't even around, David, a thousand years before King Jesus, had a tremendous revelation of the eternal love of God. There are 16 Jehovah titles in scripture. That's a big one. So, when you look at these 16, the first two are joined together and it says, love is long suffering or love is patient and love is kind. So it's like, okay, the ability to be able to get involved in something. I wanna tell you, we think of patience just means waiting something out. No, if you, if you have patience with somebody, you're willing to get involved in something that's gonna wear you out. So, so patience is not just waiting for something to happen. Guys, we need to understand our own language, amen? Patience is, okay, I got a kid here, and here's the deal. Should I take this kid fishing? Yep, I should. Okay, he's, he's seven years old. Should I take him fishing? Yes, I should. Okay, I am now gonna enter into patience. Really, that's exactly what it means. Because I wanna tell you what he's gonna do. Papa, are we going fishing now? Papa, and we're going to pitch. Papa, are we going to go fishing? Papa, can we go fishing? Papa, can we go fishing? Papa, you said we go fishing. I'm like, we're in the car. <laughs> we're going to go. We're, we're on the way, dude. We're going to get there. Okay, you're entering into some, you're entering into a relationship with somebody that's going to be pretty painful for you, but you're believing that the outcome is going to be awesome. You're just going to have to help get them there. That's patience. <laughs> Amen. The outcome is hold the fish up, take the pick. But there's a big process and you enter into patience in order to see that for that person. So patience is always selfless, amen. So attached to patience is kindness, attached to it. The Siamese twin of patience, of a willingness to enter into something difficult for the sake of the outcome of the other person, patience, is kindness. Everybody say love is kind. <laughs> Randy loves it. Love is so kind. You know, the word kind typically means a person having a given nature and often does good deeds. And I'm going to, what, what we're going to talk about here over the next nine minutes is that actually kindness has to do also with a willingness to get involved, just like patience does. That's why these two are joined together. It's a willingness to say, no, I'm going to get involved. I'm, I'm actually going to help. I'm actually going to do this. But there's an issue in our modern vernacular is we think that kindness means nice. And I'm gonna challenge that here today and hopefully by the end of this, you will know without a doubt the difference between kindness and being nice. And let me just tell you that there's a big difference between being kind and being nice. The love of God is kind, and now I'm gonna say this, and it's gonna be very controversial, it's this, the love of God is not nice. And it's like, okay, wait, stop, because the way I know Jesus is he's sweet to me. Okay, that, it's good that he's nice to you in the midst of your kindness, and he is. But he'll also be kind to you without being nice. Because his priority is kindness, and we need to understand the difference of those two things. A few months ago, I heard Jenny Donnelly say at, at our conference, God isn't always nice, but he's always kind. And it blew my mind. 
It made a powerful impact on me. Guys, have you ever just heard somebody preach and they say a phrase and it's like, boom, and it just hits you and you're like, oh, you know what? That's something I'm gonna have for the rest of my life. That's something I'm gonna have now. And I went, that is so true. I needed that language. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna walk into freedom now that I didn't walk in before because I actually have the words for it now. Thank you, Jenny Donnelly, amen? Okay, well, I can tell you, for, before I start talking about God isn't always nice, I wanna tell you for the record, I like nice. I very much like nice. And as a matter of fact, I kind of demand it. <laughs> if I hold the door open for you, and you know, if you're from Seattle and haven't shaved your legs in 20 years and you're offended that I'm actually, you know, holding the door open for you and come walking in like a tarantula and you don't respect my culture and I'm like, no ma'am, I'm gonna be nice to you. Well, you don't hold the door up for me. Then you go to the back door because I'm gonna hold this door open all day long. You're not gonna change me. That ain't gonna happen. Well, see, that ain't nice. That's not nice at all. Now that, I'm, I'm, I, if I'm in the elevator, I wanna tell you, because I like nice. I like respect, right? I like, I, like, I like being respectful, I like being generous. I especially like politeness. That's a really big deal to me. Um, and I also like being very relational people and all that falls into the nice category and I'm a nice guy. I promise you, I am. Look at y'all, you're like looking at me now. I don't think you are. I am. I'm nice. <laughs> but like, okay, like if I get on an elevator, I'm telling you, and if you're, if you're this close to me, there's no way I'm not gonna acknowledge you and be nice to you. Hey buddy, how are you doing? I'm doing good, you doing all right? Yeah, man, I am, it's good to see you. Hello ma'am, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you very much. But if you don't talk back to me, and if you ignore me while I'm being nice to you, I just start pushing every single button that's on that elevator. <laughs> that's not true. It's only been true one time. <laughs> one time it was true, but I was really young. Wouldn't do that again. Uh, no, what I'll do is I'll make up a voice and I'll start answering myself. <laughs> now, I do that. I'm a little bit ornery about being nice. I'm a little bit ornery about it. I really and truly am. And I'm like, hey, I, I you know, I, I'm like, I want to be respectful and I want people to be respectful and I want to be acknowledging and I want to be inclusive. I want to be generous. So I want those kinds of things. Last week I was in Canada and I'm telling you right now, that's some of the nicest people on the planet Earth. And I wanna tell you this also too, I went through customs in Toronto and the difference between customs in Toronto and guys, we had guns, okay? And this is the People's Republic of Canada, okay? Still, the difference between going through the Toronto customs and DFW is the difference between Mary Poppins and Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Man, we got a lot, of, a lot to learn from those people. Oh, you got a gun, eh? I do, I do. Oh yeah, we gotta be filling this out. Like, no problem. Oh, there, I can help you, no problem. Just super helpful, super nice, uh, polite, respectful. No reason to be ugly. No reason to be ugly. Why would you be ugly, DFW Airport? <laughs> Which I'm in every single week and I go, oh, I hate your union. Because you should not have this job because you are not nice. So I like nice. I want to tell you for the record, I do like nice. I promise you, I do. But nice only goes so far. For example, a person can smile and act polite, which is nice, while they tear up another person's mail. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? And I want to tell you, charming people know how to be nice, and they are up to no good. Right? Right, I, I, I'm just telling you, a, a lot of people fall prey to people because they want to be nice and they have a skill set at being nice, but they're not kind. They're not gonna be kind to you at all. They'll be nice and because you're flattered or because you're, you know, you're like, oh, well, this is a nice guy, people can take advantage of you, right? Um, another example is a person could help somebody fix their broken car, okay, but they're an old goat about it. So they're kind, but they're not nice. I mean, what are you gonna say if somebody stops and fixes your car and it's like, 
You're like, oh, thank you so much for helping me. It's like, all right, whatever. And he just goes over and starts, gang, 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 give me this right here. Gang, 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 gang. You probably should learn this when you're 12 years old. Gang, 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 gang. Boom, okay, you're good to go, bye. What are you gonna do for the rest of your life? Go, he wasn't nice. That's not what you're gonna do if you have any sense. Right, a lot of people don't have any sense anymore. Like, no, the guy stopped what he was doing and fixed your car, he was kind. So see, kindness always has to do with action and intervening. Niceness does not have that. You know, another example, nice, well, nice is reactive and kindness is proactive. Nice says, let it slide. Kindness says, I've gotta do something. Uh, Jerry and my boys and I were walking into, at the Winnipeg airport, there's a hotel there. And before we began our eight hour drive north, we, we went to this hotel and we spent the night. As we were walking in, there was a man that was dragging four pieces of luggage with him and he would take a few steps and he would lose his grip and one would slide and it was a big ramp and he picked it up and he was trying to figure out how to get up this ramp. So I walked over and I said, hey man, can I help you? And he said, yeah, you can help me. So I grabbed him, oh, that's me being kind. And we're walking up here. Then I decided to be nice. And I said, so where are you coming from? Oh, I'm coming from Tanzania. Oh man, I've made that trip so many times. I've been to Tanzania. As a matter of fact, we have a ministry in Tanzania and we help people and we feed people and we have a school and we're doing this and we're doing that. And he's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, no, I'm not. And we have this conversation and we get up there and I said, okay, sir, have a good day. That's me being nice. But me being kind was me bringing those things up the ramp. Now I wanna tell you, a lot of Canadians and travelers walked past him and said, you're almost, you're almost there, man. You got this. And that's nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making that up. It was a nice thing to do. Man, dude, you look worn out, dude. You are so worn out. Dude, you just got another half mile. That's nice, it's very nice. But it doesn't last, does it? It's not impactful. And then what will happen is those people will go to their rooms and say, I'm such a good person because I'm nice. You made no impact, no difference because you do not have agape love, kindness. It's all gonna burn up and it does not matter. And you can play a game and act like it matters, it doesn't matter. Are y'all seeing the difference between nice and agape? Okay, so the love of God is kind. It's not always nice. I'm, I'm grateful. You know, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and I praise God for how good the Holy Spirit has been to me and how good Jesus has been to me. And he has been so good to me and he's been so compassionate and, and he's been so helpful. But there are times I've got a bad spanking from the Lord. And if you have not, you don't know him or you haven't known him for very long because I promise you, God will show up with a paddle and say, I'm not here to be nice to you anymore. I told you no, I told you don't, I told you this and you said that, and we're gonna go through a time of correction. And the Bible says that. The Bible says that if you are a son of God, which means you are led by the Holy Spirit, that he chastens his sons. That's what it says. And you know what that means? That means he spanks them. And he's not nice, it's not nice to spank anybody. Yeah, so, but it's kind. Exactly right. Let me tell you what, you can sit there and let your kid put their tongue in the electrical device and be nice. <laughs> or you can be kind and say, I told you 10 times not to do that. And now you're in bad trouble. Before they kill themselves. So see, niceness and kindness is completely different. And guys, I gotta, I gotta show you guys a video. We, should, we put this video up about a month ago. It's had over a million views. We've had over a million hits. And I just did this deal saying, God ain't nice. It's not about your feelings. Now, it, it's in context, it's a little bit out of context of the message that I was preaching because that's how you do a reel. It's just gang, 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 gang. My, my media team put it together. They did a great job. They put it out there and then bam, we had a million hits. I'm gonna show you what that video is and then I'm gonna talk to you, I'm gonna talk to you about it right after. Here we go. Jesus is not nice. Everybody thinks that Jesus is nice. He's not nice, he's kind, but he ain't nice. He is a dude and he does not worry about everybody's feelings. 
He worries about the condition of your heart and the condition of your spirit and your relationship with the Father, but He really doesn't give a rip about how your feelings change from one moment to another moment to another moment to another moment. He's not a hippie. He is a warrior. Come on. All right. Okay. Out of over a million comments, over 400,000 are telling me you're whack. I, I've had over, which part? The message or me? There's one of the 400,000 right there. Security. Okay, so it's like, okay, to me that is not an abrasive video, okay? And people are like, oh my God, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a man of God. How can you say that God is nice? Because you're ignorant and you don't know what the word nice means. That's what your offense is from, is ignorance. It has nothing to do with the, it has to do with ignorance on your part that you don't understand language. It's like, look, you think that God's gonna show up. Oh, look, man, there's a drag show here. I just wanna hug everybody. No, he's not. If you're trying to molest children or if you're trying to groom children, I promise you, Jesus will not be nice. The church should not be nice in that situation. It should not be nice. I'm like, what? Like, no, no, no. I'll be kind and I'll get involved and I will protect these children and I'll walk it all the way through. But I, no, I'm sorry, I don't have to be nice. No, you have to because that's what Christianity is and people aren't gonna recognize Jesus. I don't recognize that Jesus you're talking about. I don't understand that. Somebody who will passively stand by and let that take place in the, in the name of being nice. Jesus talks about the Good Samaritan. And in the book of Luke, he gives us the story of the Good Samaritan. He says, okay, there was a Levite and there was a priest. When they saw the guy that had been robbed and he had open wounds and he was laying there, they went to the other side of the street. But another guy came in, picked him up, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, paid for the whole thing, poured, poured oil on his wounds. And Tony said, look, I got to go about my business, but I will come back and pay for whatever else happens here. And he, sa he says, this is the way that you're supposed to love people. What is that? Get involved and walk it all the way through. Was it nice? It wasn't nice when he went over there and interrupted the whole street in order to try and get this guy up and get him onto the horse and take him. It was a big scene. People were like, come on, man. That's what that guy deserves. I know that guy. Just come on, man. Listen, we got to go. It's not nice. You're disturbing my day. It's like, I don't care. I got to help this person. I have to help this person. I have to do this. And I, I, I want to I, I wanna just tell you, and I want to end with this, and this is a harsh thing to end with, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there. I'm going to tell you this. Two years ago, there was a lady who was raped on a Philadelphia subway with a train full of people who sat there and watched it. And not only did they watch it, not only they either watched it, they turned away, or they went into another train. Some people filmed it, and not one person called 911. Not one person got up and whoop the snot out of that rapist. Not one person defended that helpless girl who just was trying to get from her, from her work to her home. She had the audacity to actually have a job. Nobody helped her. Whenever that happened, Timothy Barnhart, superintendent of the police department said, I am appalled by those who did nothing to help this woman. Anybody that was on that train has to look at themselves in the mirror. Do you guys remember 1 Corinthians 13? This was a prophetic word. You guys remember? He says, they have to look at themselves in the mirror and ask themselves, why didn't I intervene? Why didn't I do something? Why didn't we do something? Hmm. Well, ask Daniel Penny. Like, who's Daniel Penny? He's the guy that just intervened on the New York subway and put a guy in a chokehold, and the guy died from the chokehold, and I would say, not because of the chokehold, but because he's on so much dope. So it's like, wait a minute, and then what happened? Here come protests, here come haters, here comes the media, here comes everybody. Why? Because he wasn't nice. He was kind. And he intervened. And it's like, the same people who said, why wouldn't you do anything, are the same people that are protesting when you do. 
So here's what I would say to this. I hear the Lord in all this. And friends, his name is Daniel Penny. Do you know what Daniel Penny means? Daniel means God is my judge. There's social justice and then there's justice. And then he's a penny. Do you know what's on the penny, guys? Who can tell me the image that's on a penny? Abraham Lincoln, what is he? He's the 16th president of the United States. What is 16? It's the love of God. Justice and the love of God. And that's in our prophetic headlines right this second. He's the 16th president that laid down his life. Laid down his life. He wasn't nice. He split our country apart. He wasn't nice. He was kind. I think today, guys, I would challenge you with this. Repent. Repent of just being nice. It's not enough to be nice. And be kind. Be proactive in the kingdom. Intervene. Don't walk past that person. Don't walk past that situation. You are full of the Holy Spirit. You're a bad motor scooter. God Almighty has been good to you and he's been kind to you. He showed up and he chased you down and he was involved in so many different things within our lives that he didn't want to and it didn't benefit him one single bit, but he still was a part of it. He still intervened. He still confronted us. He still grabbed us. He still endured us because he was kind. I think that there needs to be a great revival in the body of King Jesus of kindness. Of saying, you know what? I'm going to love people. I'm going to respect people. I am going to be nice. There's no reason for me to be ugly until there is a reason for me to be ugly. And then what I'm going to do is I'm still going to be kind. I'm going to stick with truth. The love of God is kind. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. Amen.